Okay, so thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Marco and uh, the, all the organizer for uh, thinking of me, for, uh, for inviting me to, uh, to give this course. And, uh, uh, yeah, and I, I prepared this uh, lecture on uh, uh, quench dynamics and relaxation in SLT integrable quantum spin chains. And uh, I will cover from the basics and also uh, I will, uh, uh, in the end, uh, I also will present some uh, recent results, especially in, for the dynamics in the, uh, in the presence of inhomogeneities. So this is the, the plan of the next, uh, uh, next five uh, uh, lectures. So I will start with the, the first, uh, um, essentially it will be the first lecture, an overview of quench dynamics. Then uh, I will talk about conservation laws, the importance of conservation laws in this kind of non-equilibrium dynamics. And then I will uh, uh, mention uh, pre-thermalization and uh, the analog in the integrable system, which we could call pre-relaxation, okay, we called in the, in the past. And finally, indeed, I, will, um, uh, I will tell you something about uh, quantum quenches in the presence of inhomogeneities, uh, so-called generalized aerodynamics. But okay, today, I will, oh sorry, about references. Mm, okay, I, uh, the main ideas, okay, for the first part, uh, uh, you can find in this paper, this review uh, that I wrote with uh, Fabian Esler uh, two or three years ago. And uh, well, mm, I will uh, probably follow a slightly different approach, but uh, the, the gist is there, okay, for, uh, especially for the part on uh, quantum quenches. Then for the part on uh, pre-relaxation, I will use this, uh, this paper that I wrote with Bruno Bertini. And uh, uh, for the part on uh, the, uh, the, mm, the time evolution in the presence of inhomogeneities, instead I will, uh, uh, you can find some, uh, uh, some, some useful information in this paper. And then, the, but uh, anyway, I will, uh, uh, I will also present some original uh, uh, something original so that you can find anywhere. So maybe I will uh, I'll post then on the archive uh, some, some notes and um, you also have paper. Okay, so, the, so this is the plan for, for today. For today we will uh, just cover the first point or part of it. So I will start uh, uh, talking about relaxation, tell you what do we mean with relaxation in isolated uh, medibody quantum systems. Then we uh, will consider uh, time averages and the uh, infinite time limit in the system. And then in particular, I would like to focus the attention on the, what we say, the space spanned by the uh, by non-equilibrium state after a so-called quantum quench. And uh, if I have time, but I doubt, I will also tell you something about uh, the uh, Lee Robinson bounds. So probably this you will be covering the next, uh, next lecture with uh, uh, the second point. Okay, so, uh, Let's start with the point 1A. Uh, what do we mean with relaxation in, uh, uh, in isolating medibody quantum system? So first of all, uh, what we consider, as written here, we consider isolated systems. So with isolated, I mean that the, you can describe uh, the, the, the system is in some, uh, uh, some state that we will assume to be pure. So a quantum state, so set zero will be a state at time t equals zero. And then we uh, assume that the, uh, the dynamics is described by Hamiltonian. Yeah. So this, the, the system is closed. So you have the state at time t is equal to e to the minus i h t in the state at the time zero. OK? Now, uh, the, the system that I consider, okay, here is being changed in general, okay, most of the results I will present uh, can be applied to many body systems in general. I will focus on spin chains, but you can, uh, if you prefer, you can imagine lattice systems uh, or also quantum field theories. So the important part is that you must have many uh, degrees of freedom, 
in your in your system. Then uh, now this protocol of, uh, of uh, this was called I say this is kind of uh, uh, the basic uh, time evolution quantum mechanics. But then this was renamed in a sense quantum quench uh, almost 15 years ago by John Cardi uh, because he had in mind uh, a, uh, the term the, the quench at final temperature where one studied the effect of changing apparently the temperature in a system and instead in the in the quantum setup uh, he thought uh, that uh, you can imagine to have a uh, Hamiltonian H mm, which depends on some parameter a parameter that can be a coupling constant for example okay some interaction term and uh, you can imagine for example uh, I just write a possible spin chain Hamiltonian so it can be something like this okay this is the Hamiltonian of the easy model and then you see that the, the parameter in this case is uh, uh, can be chosen to be the magnetic field, the external field. And then the idea was to, uh, to imagine to prepare the, the state in the ground state of uh, the Hamiltonian for a given value of the parameter. So you prepare, you fix the Hamiltonian at the time zero to be h of g zero. Mm? And then you, for example, if you are interested in the uh, in the uh, low temperature properties, then you choose the state which is the ground state of this Hamiltonian. Okay? So psi 0, H0, psi 0 is equal E ground state psi 0. But okay, you can also, if you are interested in the finite temperature state, you can also start from a, a Gibbs ensemble, for example, from E to the minus beta H0. Okay? But okay, we will focus on a pure state okay, in, this, in this course. And, uh, uh, and then, okay, the idea was that at the time t equals zero, uh, then the, the, uh, this parameter, which is a global parameter because it, it couples with uh, all the degrees of freedom the, along the chain, so it's changed. Somehow, so you can see the time evolution where now you, at the time t equals zero, you change the Hamiltonian in h1, which is h of g1. And then you study the time evolution with this new Hamiltonian. So essentially, it's this what I wrote here and now but the, the, the main difference is that we are uh, choosing particular initial states so we are not choosing a random initial state we are choosing here states that are uh, ground state for example Hamiltonian with uh, nice properties which can be for example local uh, local interaction or, or interaction decay sufficiently fast to zero mm -hmm. so uh, okay then what is the uh, Mm. Now, the in the system, uh, in the, uh, as you read there, uh, uh, I will to explain what we mean with relaxation. And first of all, why it's, uh, it's not so trivial to think about relaxation. Now, the reason why uh, it's, uh, it's not trivial is because this is a quantum system. The time evolution is unitary. So uh, you can't really expect that you have uh, some form of relaxation in the limit of large time, simply because the limit of large time doesn't exist. And there are theorems showing this. Indeed, in particular, there is a, the, a quantum recurrence theorem that tells us that, uh, well, if you consider, for example, a, a system with a discrete, uh, with discrete energy eigenvalues, and if we restrict to lattice, spin, uh, uh, lattice system or spin chains that we have this, we are in this condition, so discrete energy eigenvalues, and then uh, say if uh, psi is uh, some uh, state and uh, it evolves under this Hamiltonian, then you can always find a, a time t, capital T, which can be a bit very large, but you can find this time such that the, the state practically is very close to the initial state. Mm? And then, uh, so you see that this means that uh, whatever you do, you will find always a time when your state becomes almost the same as the initial state. So we can really... Uh, think of some relaxation in the U in the uh, a, a relaxation of the entire state in uh, uh, for when there is a unitary time evolution. Uh, sorry, close. Ah, close means exactly what is written there. So that if you if you compute the norm mm, uh, of the difference between the state at the time t capital T and the state at the time zero, this can be made arbitrarily small. You can choose the parameter. You can bound. The, the distance between the state, and then you find always, independent of the bound, you will find always a time 
such that so this bound is uh, is respected. Okay. And this okay, this applies to when the uh, the the spectrum is discrete. Okay, in particular. So um, uh, well, there are in this paper also some comments about because okay, this problem was studied before by uh, von Neumann in 1929, sorry, and uh, he showed that uh, some of there is some mm, you can prove a, a kind of ergodic theorem in quantum systems, but okay, you you, you have some uh, you, your system should satisfy some assumption, and there were here. Uh, uh, questioning the uh, the generality of the of the assumptions. Uh, moreover, moreover, okay, as you can read here, then they want they point out that the, uh, the expectation value of macroscopic observables and uh, what is a macroscopic observable? Now, in a, in a spin chain, is uh, macroscopic. Is something of this form. For example, in a spin chain, you have the, to consider the average over the entire system of some uh, uh, extensive quantity. So it can be, for example, the average uh, spin in a given direction. This is a macroscopic observer. And so they, they point out that they, uh, even if uh, uh, the macroscopic observer uh, reach some form of equilibrium, at some point they, they don't remain uh, they, they can change the, the particular, the, their value so with the time. So they, they won't uh, really relax, even macroscopic observers. This means, in other words, that you can always find a very, very extremely large time such that this value changes. Okay. So you see that the, this is the, uh, the first problem to overcome in the systems, because now we can't just uh, uh, talk about relaxation in, uh, in uh, in the sense that uh, we, we had in mind, so some the existence of the infinite time limit. And uh, mm, okay, but at least uh, you see here that there is an assumption. The assumption, the assumption is that the, the spectrum should be discrete. Instead, we know that when uh, you take a general thermodynamic limit or you consider a continuum system, uh, well, yeah, but you, you, you find also uh, a, a non continuous, a non discrete part of the spectrum, continuous part. So what about the situation? Maybe we are luckier. Well, not really. Because even, even if the spectrum is not continuous, is not uh, discrete, you can always define observables like this, for example, you define observable O, which is like this, E, e prime plus E prime E. So the only uh, non-zero matrix elements are between two eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with energy E and E prime, E different from E prime. Okay? And now what you find is that if you set the time evolution of this observable, in some state, mm. then okay, this is trivial because when you apply the uh, the Hamiltonian, you just find E. So what you find here is something like uh, twice. Okay, let's write it equal side zero uh, e to the i e t e e prime e minus e prime t plus the emission conjugate set zero okay so what you see is that this expectation value keep keeps oscillating uh, forever so you can always construct this kind of artificial as a observables that do not relax even if the, the spectrum is not discrete okay this holds in general so clearly, if you want to uh, define relaxation, we have to uh, to be uh, a bit more. Um, uh, we have to, uh, to to change our way of thinking about relaxation. Let's say. So uh, what can we do? Okay, the I think that the uh, uh, the simplest way of defining relaxation is to uh, replace the limit of infinite time with uh, time average. 
This is kind of a weak form of relaxation because when you, you can imagine if you have some oscill oscillatory behavior like here, then uh, we are now covering uh, also the time evolution of the observable because this averages to zero, for example. So you, have, you are removing all this oscillation, homotic oscillation, in this uh, weak form of, uh, of weak form form of relaxation time average. So with time average, I mean that you have uh, you are you are interested in some the expectation value of some observable. Mm -hmm. So uh, and you you defined the average expectation value, for example, like this, 1 over capital T, the integral from 0 to capital T, the T of the expectation value, the T, observable, psi T. OK? And now, well, uh, now it's, uh, it's very easy to show, at least if, if, you, if you assume that the spectrum is discrete. Mm? And uh, that the and okay this, the Hilbert space is finite. You can immediately show that the limit uh, of infinite capital T exists. How do we do this? Well, let's assume that the spectrum is discrete. So and we assume that the minimum. Okay. So now we prove. Okay. If you want, it's a theorem. This. So limit T goes to infinity of O. T. Okay, exists. Uh, this limit exists. Okay, when we assume uh, the assumption is that assuming that delta. Okay, let's say zero no. minimum. Okay, so you, you consider all the difference of energies in your spectrum, and because it's discrete, that will be okay. And assuming that the Hilbert space is finite, like in a spin, uh, in a spin chain, uh, then what you have is that this number is finite, mm? and uh, is uh, um, it is larger than zero. Then how do you how do you prove this? Let's see. Sorry. So, ah, I didn't write it. So what you do is that you write this expectation value explicitly. So we we expand the state at time t in the basis diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. E then you have this is equal to e to the minus i e t the eigenstate of the energy and now we want to compute this uh, this average so you have uh, the average of the expectation value of o is equal to 1 over t the integral from 0 to t in the t of the uh, e to the minus okay there is a sum over e and e prime of the uh, e to the um, i e prime uh, e minus e prime t, and then you have the psi zero uh, e e o e prime e prime set zero. So what I did here, I put some uh, two completeness uh, relation uh, in here and here. Mm -hmm. And then I apply the time evolution operator to the other state of the, of the energy so that you find the space. OK? Now, um, you decompose it on, on which in the, I, I decompose in an address, in the basis that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. Yeah, a, a basis such Ah, H, H1, sorry, okay. This is H1 E equal E H1. 
OK? Uh, H0 is only usable to construct initial state. Then we will never uh, use it uh, anymore. OK? So it's, uh, yes. Maybe in your formula, formula for psi you should put some weight on Some weight? Uh, yeah. Where? Just yeah. above. You are right, yes. <laughs> I forgot something important. OK, you have also the. Uh, in the bottom form is okay because I just thought, <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> this is just the instruction. Yeah. So here I introduced the, is, uh, the coefficient are here in the, in the overlap between the, the state and the, and the eigenstates. Okay, so uh, now we can, uh, uh, because okay, this is a, uh, yeah, let's assume the, the inverse space is finite, so no problem in uh, uh, interchanging the sum of the integral, yeah? So this is just the integral of a phase, we know how to do that. So it's 1 over t sum e e prime, and it becomes e to the i e minus e prime capital T, e prime capital T minus 1 over i e minus e prime times all the rest. Okay? Say so 0 e e e prime e prime set zero now <coughs> what can we use okay uh, okay this uh, I've been a bit uh, sloppy in fact because okay here you you have to distinguish whether e is equal to e prime or e is different from e prime e prime because this result is true when e is different from e prime where this is just a phase Otherwise, if you want, you have to take the limit, or you just uh, uh, you have to compute the integral from 0 to capital T of 1, which is equal to capital T. So divided by capital T is equal to 1. So you have plus the sum over all the energy of psi 0 T, norm squared, and the expectation value of the observables in the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. OK? So now, uh, so this term still depends on capital T, but now uh, what we have is that in the uh, in the lim you can bound this term uh, using that uh, the minimum of the absolute value of Vn minus Em is uh, uh, is larger than zero. So this is smaller or equal to okay the the absolute value. Let's say the absolute value of this average minus the, the term on the right there, diagonal part, OK, norm of this is smaller or equal to the uh, sum of E different from E prime of the norm of this, the absolute value of this, which is uh, 2, is more or equal to 2, divided by delta. And then you have, OK, the maximum of this. OK, maximum. Let's consider the maximum value of this, of this part, of the sum. So, and there is a capital T. So what you have is that you can find a sufficiently large t, mm, which you see that it should be, what should be large is delta times capital T. So when you, are, you, you can find if uh, delta is the distance of the uh, energy levels, then you can find this very, very large t, such that this term is, uh, uh, approaches 0. And so you end up with this result, which is independent of capital T. Mm. So this to shows you that if you consider term averages, then you you overcome the problem of, uh, uh, of the definition of relaxation in the, uh, in the infinite time limit. Now, what you see here, uh, rather clearly, I think, if you, if you work on, uh, for example, on spin chains and, uh, and or lattice systems, is that uh, this capital T should be much larger than your system general. It's extremely large. Because when you uh, increase the number of degrees of freedom in a many-body system, then the level approach one another. So this, this delta becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. 
and they, they become they can be attached uh, they, they cause, can also decrease exponentially with the system size so this become extremely small so in order to apply this result you have to take really really huge huge times okay nevertheless okay this is a uh, just to show you that there is a <coughs> you can find a, a sufficiently large time such that the, the time average in a finite system uh, approaches a stationary stationary value but now the natural question is now what how can we use this so what's the meaning of this stationary value should we really uh, consider this extremely long times and uh, uh, is it usable for something and uh, in order to answer this question well we can uh, um, <coughs> we can compute the, uh, the variance of the distribution over the time to see how close will be the expectation value mm, at a given time, uh, close to the, to the average. Okay. <coughs> this is independent of integrability. No, uh, what I mean is that you, you just, when you choose the basis, you, uh, because you you have the free freedom here to choose the energies, no? So you don't uh, have to, to consider two energy eigenstates with the same energy. You just consider, because if you have two of them, then you can just uh, find the linear combination, which has the maximal overlap with the state. So by assumption, all the E here, E is different from E prime, always, here. Okay, so there are no problems over. It's true what you are saying, that uh, depending on whether the system is generic or non-generic, or integrable, then you have uh, this delta approaches zero in a different way. This is, uh, this is correct. But this is completely general, so this is a uh, generic quantum system. Okay, so. So now uh, the question is indeed, what's the meaning of this average? And so in order to, uh, to answer this, this question, I think it's useful to compute this limit. Limit for, uh, I call delta, delta capital T, okay, over each power, okay, that approaches zero, it approaches infinity, sorry, of one over capital T of the integral from zero to T in the t of psi t observable minus the average psi of t squared. So what am I doing here? I compute, I compute the variance hmm? respect to the average. So let's do this, uh, this calculation. Ready? Okay. Now this is equal to the limit delta t approaches infinity of 1 over capital T, the integral from 0 to capital T in dt of psi uh, t o minus, now here we have the average, and what I do is because this limit exists, you know, capital T approaches infinity exists, I replace this by the infinite time limit, so this h infinity. psi t squared. Now, this is equal to <coughs> limit delta t approaches infinity of 1 over capital T, integral from 0 to capital T in the t. And now, what we have? This term here is just given by the sum over the diagonal part. Okay? You have always said e is equal to e prime. This is the way to select this O uh, bar infinity. So when we subtract it, we are just saying that in the sum we have to uh, remove all the terms where E is equal to E prime. So we end up indeed with what we computed before, this part, okay, of the expectation value. So what we have is this is equal to, okay, what is it? Mm -hmm. Give me that, of sum <coughs> over E different from uh, E prime of <coughs> E observable O E prime E to the I T E minus E prime okay, I think. 
then there is psi 0 e e prime psi 0 and everything is squared now when you square it again you uh, you you add okay let's do it this is equal to limit delta t goes to infinity 1 over t integral from 0 to t in dt now we would have to sum over four energies but now you have that you have these phases so in order to have a non-zero limit when you take the average you have to select the uh, the uh, the terms where the difference of the energies in the first sum is equal to a difference of the energies in the other sum so let's uh, i write it so you have you have this there are some terms here and then there is e to the i t e minus e prime no and then you have this multiplied by the sum over e tilde different from e tilde prime of something here e to the i t e tilde minus e tilde prime you have this now you have to find the values of e tilde prime and e tilde that simplify such that this phase simplifies the other one okay now for the sake of simplicity here we assume that uh, the all the difference of energies are incommensurable from each other so you can't obtain uh, you can't find to uh, a mm, let's say uh, en minus em okay e minus e prime divided by e second minus e third is uh, uh, is not a rational number whatever energies you consider okay clear e, e should be different e, e second and e, e third should be different from e and e prime otherwise you'll find uh, one or minus one so we just assume this just to uh, to avoid complication here and then when you when you take this limit what do you find you say the result is a sum over all the energy e different for e prime of the norm of the, the absolute squared uh, absolute value of the of the overlap between the state and the, and the eigenstate of energy e and e prime squared and then here you have the squared okay. you have this okay. So here we compute the, the variance okay, of the uh, uh, respect to the to the uh, to the to the to the average value of these position values over the time, and then we obtain this result. Okay, the first observation: this result is non-zero. Okay, it's non-zero, so it means that uh, there is a width, so you you don't have a relaxation really, so the state uh, keep uh, being different from its average, as we as we know for, from the theorem. And uh, uh, what happens, in fact, is that if you now replace uh, psi naught and the energies with some uh, uh, physically relevant case, when in particular you have uh, uh, Hamiltonian with local interactions and whatever, then what you find is that this term here approaches zero in the thermodynamic limit. So if you have your finite system, then you compute this, and then you, uh, you, you increase the number the number of sides so you do it for a given number l sides mm? then you take the limit l goes to infinity and then you find that this term approaches zero so this means that uh, uh, in the end in, in average it's really uh, the, this kind of uh, time average capture the uh, uh, the behavior the most uh, likely uh, expectation values for the observables so the, mm, this diagonal, okay, this uh, time average makes makes sense, okay? Let's do. It. But okay, the, uh, what's the problem with this limit? The problem with this limit is that uh, in order to obtain this result, we assumed that we assume that delta. minimum okay. 
okay? The, the, uh, the minimum uh, space in between two energy levels is finite. In the temporal limit, this becomes zero, generally. They approach one another, both in generic system or in integrable systems. So what you, what you have is that in order to, to see that the expression goes to zero, you have to consider large and larger times, always. So it's a kind of a, uh, not very nice limit, I would say. Because from a statistical point of view, uh, we, okay, generally we would like to consider the, uh, the system in the thermodynamic limit. So when the number of bits of freedom approaches infinity, so that we can see, for example, uh, effect like uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, or we can see uh, phase transitions. And then so we, we really don't want to study this particular limit, where the time instead should be very large in comparison with the, with the, with the system size. I want to mention that the, the, in practice, if you have, uh, uh, if you are working, for example, with experimentalists or whatever, this is maybe sometimes the limit that you would like to consider, because experimentally, they, uh, when you prepare this uh, uh, this system, in particular in cold atoms, you have only a finite number of uh, of degrees of freedom, and you are able to reach uh, large large times. So, in, in fact, in uh, in experiments, sometimes it's more convenient to consider this particular limit. Okay? But from a theoretical point of view, I prefer really to, to work in the thermodynamic limit or for very large subsystem and to consider the, uh, the behavior in, this, uh, 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 in, in the limit where the time is uh, much smaller than the system size. But okay, but then uh, what do we know in that case? So if the time is much smaller than the system size. <coughs> Okay, I use that because let's assume that the, you you find the two uh, another pair of energies, uh, for example, with the same value of v minus e prime. Mm -hmm. Then, when you perform this average, you have also to to consider the, those particular pair, because then uh, you can simplify the phase with those pair. Ah, okay. okay. So in uh, so here it wouldn't be just so easily so easy the the sum. The result doesn't change much, but anyway, it's um, just to simplify the calculation, the result. Okay. Now, if we now assume that the, the, uh, the number of uh, spins, the number of sat is large, and the time where here j is just an energy scale, in the Hamiltonian, for example, so j time should be much smaller than L. So now we consider a different limit, uh, which is the first step to take the thermodynamic limit, where L is large. So the question is, uh, what can, uh, can we say about uh, relaxation? Mm. So what about this, uh, for example, this time average? Well, uh, now let's define again the time average as before. So we have that uh, now we can, uh, maybe I should tell you before. Uh, what is the diagonal ensemble? Yes. OK, uh, first of all, I would like to, to give a name to this time average. OK, I should before in the, in the, finance, the finance system. So we, we found before the result that the expectation value of the observables, uh, uh, the average of the expectation value in the limit of infinite time is equal to the sum over the energies of E, E. And then you have the, the expectation value of the observable. Sorry, what am I doing here? Uh, you have uh, psi 0. What is E, E here? There is no E. Psi zero e squared e sub e. So we found this. Now we can rewrite this expression in a convenient form, like as follows. So you can write this as a trace of the sum over the energies of e e psi zero e squared. Trace of this object 
times multiplied by the observable. So in this way, you recognize that this expectation value is like an expectation value so of the observable O in a state which is this one, in this density matrix, row bar, hmm? which is generally called the diagonal ensemble. So what is this? It's just you consider the density matrix of the entire system, which for a pure state, the density matrix is psi psi of the pure, pure state. Then what you do here is that you write this density matrix in the base, in the base is diagonalized the Hamiltonian, and you uh, remove all the off-diagonal terms. So you are left with the diagonal part of this, of this matrix. So you have rho in this basis. It's like a uh, diagonal part and also elements here, this rho. This rho bar instead has the same diagonal part but as zero. The of diagonal terms. This is why it's called diagonal ensemble. Okay? And it's diagonal in a base is diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. Okay, now uh, let's, uh, let's now consider the, this other limit. So a large number of sides and, uh, and times which are not so large. We want we define again the uh, a time average density matrix which is the integral from 0 to capital T, d, uh, d over capital T. Mm. Now what you have is that if you define rho bar in this way, then you have that the expectation value of O, the average of the expectation, of expectation value of O up to time capital T is equal to uh, the, uh, the trace of rho bar capital T O, okay? Like making the same steps that I made here, okay? So this is my definition of uh, time average density matrix. But now I want to consider this other limit. And uh, well, so what uh, is much more complicated now because you can expect that we can just write results independently of the system details. But there is still something that we can learn uh, without specifying the system, okay? Also in this case. In particular, for example, we can compute the, the commutator between this average state So we could compute the commutator. Oh, interesting. What's happening? Done. Okay. Between the minus i commutator h and this rho bar of capital T. Now this is equal to the integral from zero to capital T, the T over capital T, of the uh, well minus i commutator h and psi t, psi t, which is e to the minus i h t, psi 0, psi 0, e to the i h t, mm, is the commutator. Now, we recognize that uh, this term here is nothing but the derivative with respect to, there is a t here, with respect to t of this object. So this is equal to the integral from 0 to capital T, the T over <coughs> capital T of the derivative with respect to T of uh, psi T psi T. So the integral of the derivative is the integral of is this itself. So this is equal to psi capital T, psi capital T minus psi 0, psi 0 over capital T. Now, if we uh, compute now the norm of this commutator, what we find is that the norm of h rho bar t is uh, with the norm I could choose, for example, the maximal eigenvalue of this, of this operator. And this is uh, uh, the square root of 1 minus 
psi okay, t psi 0 squared over capital T. The overlap is always more than the absolute value of the overlap is always smaller or equal to 1. So this is always, this is just a number, find a number. Then because it's divided, this is equal. Because this is divided by capital T, it means that in the limit t goes to infinity, this approaches 0. So we are just saying that the, uh, the, uh, the time derivative, the, the norm of the uh, derivative respect to the time of the average approaches 0. So this suggests that indeed we can have uh, some form of relaxation even if you are in the opposite limit. When, because here we, I never use that the, the system is finite. Okay? And just, I, I, uh, well, I, I, think, I think I didn't use it. Uh, this, uh, this holds for any, for any system. And so what suggests that indeed even if you consider the limit now L much larger than 1 JT much more than if you consider the limit limit T goes to infinity of uh, limit L goes to infinity hmm, of the time average over T over T okay the time average of some uh, observable say O capital T average then there is an indication that this exists, this limit, okay? Because we compute the norm of the derivative of the expectation value, we found that approach is zero. But uh, in fact, in the system, we consider the, uh, the state makes even stronger. Because when you consider global quenches, again, so you prepare your state in the ground state of the model with a given value of the parameter, you change the parameter, and now you consider this limit. In fact, the, the infinite limit exists in a stronger sense, so not only in average. So what you find is that in these systems, so when you consider a global quench from G0 to another value of the parameter G, hmm, then what you find is that usually if you for a particular class of observables with particular properties, so uh, let's say nice, for, a, for now let's just call them nice observables, hmm, then what you find is that limit T limit uh, exists the limit JT goes to infinity of limit L goes to infinity of the expectation value of the observable at the time T. Okay? Which is much stronger than the other result because this is equivalent to what you can't prove in a, in a finite system. So that the, the uh, in fact, the observable relax. In this case, if you take the thermodynamic limit and if you restrict to a nice class of observables, then the expectation value approaches a, a, a stationary value. Okay? What this exactly do we have the, this uh, thermodynamic limit in all this? Well, this uh, I don't have the thermodynamic limit. This is completely general. What I'm saying is that you can always find uh, the, the time average here. You mean the time average or in the? Uh, yeah, the time average. In the time average here, there is no L. So you can, uh, uh, you can either fix L or you imagine that you consider your limit in the thermodynamic limit, and then you compute the limit of infinite time. You, you are, I think maybe you are thinking about some scaling limit, and I think it can be true as well that the diagonal, uh, that this time average approaches a stationary value in some scaling limit, where T scales with L. Because there is no notion of L here. So, okay. But OK, here, instead, it's a very different situation. Because here, I'm saying that you take first the thermodynamic limit, and then you take the, the limit of infinite time. Otherwise, this doesn't happen generally. So you have the observers that keep oscillating. Uh, in this, I, I didn't. OK, I can. Ah, uh, here, yes, because uh, what I'm saying is that here, you can uh, do it also in the thermodynamic limit. You can remove all the notion of L in your system. Yeah, I didn't use it. So we just take the limit L goes to infinity. And because this doesn't L doesn't appear here in this estimate, so it means that we can, we have suggestion. I'm, uh, well, I'm just saying suggestion because, well, I, uh, here we just computed the norm of the, uh, of the time derivative of the density matrix, so I think it's not, this is not uh, uh, sufficient 
to prove it. But uh, anyway, there is a suggestion that this limit exists. Mm? And then what I'm telling you is that for this particular class of observables, which then we'll see they are local observables, then the limit uh, in a stronger sense exists. First thermodynamic limit, and then infinite time limit of the expectation value, not of the average. Here there is an average. Here there was an average. You see? Hmm? Here instead I will remove the average. It's just the expectation value of the of the observer. So what I mean, what you find is that the expectation value of O as a function of T can be something like this. Hmm? Okay, and then approach some value, some stationary value. If L is finite, what you see is that uh, after a while it starts oscillating again. But if you take the thermodynamic limit, this part, this time approach infinity. So this time scale t tilde, scale with L, and in the limit it goes, uh, L goes to infinity, approaches infinity. So you don't see this part when the, uh, the, uh, the, the expectation bell starts oscillating again. Okay? So this is why you, you see the, uh, 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 you see the emergence of a stationary, stationary value. Uh, sorry? This time, you mean? Uh, well, not in these general terms. I'm not, I'm not able. Maybe it's possible to find some estimates of this. Um, because it, I, by experience, I can tell you that uh, uh, this time scale is proportional to the number of sites in a spin chain, okay, usually. And uh, uh, so, for example, you see relaxation even if you scale the time, like for example, square root of uh, of L, you still see that the limit exists in some cases. Then it, it really it starts depending on your system, the system you consider. When you, it's not, I, I Yes, what I mean is that here you don't see the effect of delta. In order to prove before that the, the limit exists, uh, then we have to really consider a very, very large time. Here instead, apparently, we, I, it's just suggesting that you, you don't need to consider these large times. But you see, there is, all, there is still a limit here. Okay, so, mm, and here I, I, I want to stress that this is just a, a necessary condition for the limit to exist. It's that I just computed the derivative of the uh, of the time average density uh, state. So I, I doubt this is a, a sufficient condition to assure that the, uh, the, the limit exists. I'm just saying that there is a, uh, there is a suggestion that this limit exists. Okay, so far. And then I'm just telling you that uh, there is even more because in the, in the thermodynamic limit, the limit exists in a stronger sense. In, uh, I, uh, you, you see, I'm just, uh, I didn't, um, mm, assume anything about the system. So I, I really don't, I don't feel comfortable in just stating that the, the limit exists or whatever, I don't know. I, I want to avoid to, to tell you something wrong. So, okay. So can you just repeat uh, which are this, in which cases you can, you can see that this works, this nice observable? Okay, we, we will uh, come back later to this, but uh, what I'm saying is that you, uh, you can imagine, uh, uh, you can still, uh, 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 understand why, but if you consider observables uh, which are which have a support, a bounded support in your uh, system, so they act non trivially only in a small part of the system. So you have your. Uh, so your Let's assume this is your. Uh, well, no. This well, 2D, I don't know why 2D lattice, for example. And now you can see some observer that only in a small part of it, which can be, for example, the spin, the product of the spin in this particular position. Now, when you take the thermodynamic limit, you are increasing here, no? the dimension on the space. But you can imagine that increasing it, the, uh, the effect of the, uh, the finite size effect uh, 
becomes smaller and smaller increasing L. If you fix the observer to be in a part of the system and you just enlarge the system. So this is indeed why these are the nice observers, the term for which you can take this, this limit. But we'll come back uh, later in, uh, to this, uh, in the, in probably in the next, uh, uh, next lecture. Okay. Other questions? Okay, fine. Yes. Okay. In order to have the, uh, uh, the, the existence of the limit in the strong sense, yes. In order to be sure. Then there could be exception, okay, you can find out a scaling limit, but this is a, a limit where generally if you have a translation invariant system, at least this, uh, this limit exists. Okay. Okay, but now, uh, if we now uh, consider these nice observables and in the after global quenches, then let's assume that the two limits exist. So we have that the, the limit of infinite time exists in this sense. Limit jt goes to infinity. The t of limit l goes to infinity of the expectation value is equal to expectation value to infinity and then we have also the other limit now we consider infinite chain so we consider the limit and we prove in this case that exists uh, uh, the limit L goes to infinity of the limit JT now goes to infinity first before the thermodynamic limit say T ho say T and now we call this oh sorry there is an average here zero capital T, 1 over capital T, and here there is J capital T goes to infinity. Hmm? Infinity. So both limits exist. So the question is, okay, uh, are they the same? Are they different? Because if you want to define, give a meaning to relaxation, we must be precise. And uh, I can tell you that generally these two limits are different. If you consider a general system, if you put some, uh, even if you just put a defect, on your system, then you find generally different results. But at least there are uh, situations where they are exactly the same. Okay, uh, at least I don't know, for which I don't know exceptions. And the, the assumption is that if you consider translation invariant systems, <coughs> okay, if you consider, so for translation invariant system, for They generally coincide. They are, they are generally identical. Okay. This is not a theorem, so I uh, I think that uh, one could find uh, exceptions, uh, but uh, for, for so far I don't. Uh, I just don't know exception to this. Okay. But uh, usually you, you, okay, how can you find exception? It's, uh, I can give you a, um, a hint of uh, when you find that these two limits are different. Let's assume that in your system, uh, your final system, there, are, uh, there is uh, something which is conserved, a conservation law, that is not exactly conserved in the finite system. So imagine that they have some uh, tails, okay, that they are not able to close in the system. So it's, uh, it's only approximately conserved. But this conservation becomes conserved in the limit of infinite, uh, in the intertermodynamic limit. These are the situations where these two limits could be different. Okay? But in, uh, in, the C in the case that we will consider, they are mm, always the same. Okay? <coughs> in the integrable system we consider. Okay, if you want to... No, no, no it's, uh, it's okay for me because then... Mm, yeah, yeah, we will start something. Okay, also. okay. Okay, we can start again. So, so I was telling you that in the, in the case, uh, at least that we will consider uh, generally these two uh, limits are the same, give the same result. And so one question could be, okay, what is more convenient? Okay, uh, if you are interested in the, uh, so, so first of all, this means that we can, uh, uh, it's easy to define relaxation 
because at least uh, there is no ambiguity here. Whether you define in one way or in the other, then you obtain the same result. And this is one of the reasons in our community uh, there is a group of people that prefer generally to work with time averages, and there is another group that instead uh, define relaxation in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that this ambiguity remains just because these two limits usually are the same. So, uh, so there is no. Um, yeah, anyway. So, the. Um, so, one question could be what is interesting? If you are. How, how can you compute this? What's the best way? Uh, should you compute? Is it easier to compute the time average in the limit of infinite uh, times uh, for small system, or is it easier to work in the thermodynamic limit? And uh, in order partially to answer this question, I, I would like to consider what I wrote there, the space spanned by a non-equilibrium state. What do I mean with that? So under time evolution, your state changes. Okay? And uh, now if you imagine to expand the state in a given base, whatever, your preferred basis, okay? now you can write set 0 is equal sum over n of uh, some coefficient. And then these are the, uh, the, the basis where you want to expand it. Now, uh, when, you, uh, when you consider time evolution, then clear this coefficient become time, de time dependent. Okay? If you are uh, sufficiently smart, you can choose a basis here such that you have uh, a, a just a, a, a small number of, uh, uh, of the states of your basis with a non-zero overlap, with a significant overlap with your state. So you can describe your, your state with uh, less information, let's say. So uh, what I mean is that, OK, this is exact. Now what you can say is that, OK, let's assume that uh, I, I can approximate the state by another state by truncating this particular sum to a given value, m. OK? And then you do this. Clearly, you commit an error here. Yeah, no? And the error uh, can be estimated by the, the norm, for example, or the difference. So you have the, the, the norm sum n goes from n plus 1 to infinity of a n of t phi n is your error. So error, the norm of this, that clear is OK. Sum n, because the, it's an orth if it is an orthonormal basis, then this is just given by, no, well, um, is the maximum, no? I guess, yeah. Uh, OK, I, I, if I'm not wrong, should be uh, larger than m of a n. Uh, Put a square, a n of t. It can be something like this. Anyway, a, a norm. You you can choose your favorite norm, and then you you can define the error in your uh, in your favorite way. Okay. So what I mean is that instead of uh, clearly, the, uh, if you have, for example, a spin chain, a spin one half chain, the number of degrees of freedom for spin one half, spin one half chain with l l sides, the num the dimension of the space is 2 to the L, OK? So uh, this means that in this, uh, the number of states that you need to consider, in principle, is 2 to the L, extremely large number. Now what I'm saying is that, well, let's imagine that you find a, a good basis such that you can truncate this, this sum up to a given M, capital M. Clearly, OK, if you fix the time, you can always find the basis where this number is equal to 1, because you choose your uh, initial state as the your state psi 0 as an element of the basis, and you're done. But now the problem, what, I'm, uh, what I want to study is that, uh, let's assume you fix the basis a priori. Mm? And then, uh, so you could, in principle, also put the initial state as an element of the basis. But then uh, I want to, to choose this basis in a very uh, smart way, in such a way that in the entire time window that I'm interested in, I can approximate a state committing a given error. Uh, by, by, cut, by truncating the, the, the basis on a, on a subset, 
on the smallest subset that I can. And the question is uh, how this uh, size of the subset depends on the, on the properties of the set, depends on the time, depends on the, on the dimension of the system. Is it clear the, the question that I'm asking? Yeah, okay. And so, okay, uh, how can we do this? Hmm? A possibility is that uh, is to consider exactly the time average that I defined before. Why? Because the time average is the average of the state at every time. Okay? So this means that in the time average, you have all the states that appear here. So they appear there. Okay? They are average, so the coefficient is somehow uh, normalized with the time. But still, you, uh, you consider the time average, you have that the, the uh, the, mm, all, the, all the states that are important here are not orthogonal to the time average. Okay. And what is the best basis to consider? Well, it's not difficult to answer this question. Because you have, uh, uh, imagine, so you define, we define the time average in this way. Uh, psi tau. Hmm. Now, if you imagine to diagonalize this operator, okay, in a in a basis diagonalize this operator, you have uh, this diagonal, some basis, hmm, and you have some uh, some eigenvalues here. This is a density matrix, so the eigenvalues are uh, uh, non-negative, and the sum of the eigenvalues equal to one. Okay, so here yeah, imagine to sort them from the biggest uh, uh, to the smaller. So you have lambda 1 is the largest one, lambda 2, and so on. And this is lambda 2 to the L. Mm? So a very good way to approximate this density matrix is just to, to cut the density matrix, the, the, the eigen state of the density matrix. So you are saying, OK, I want to keep the most probable states. Mm? And what I leave is that the well, uh, uh, eigenvalues which are very, very small and some uh, such that they somehow are related to the error that I want to commit uh, approximating the state. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that you have this density matrix. Now you can write this in the uh, basis diagonalized. So you will have some sum over n of uh, lambda n, which depends clearly on the time. And here you have uh, some states which depend on the time. This is your, your time average. And here, I'm uh, simply assuming that lambda n uh, is always of t. It's larger or equal to lambda n plus 1 of t. Mm? And then what I'm saying is that uh, here I want to truncate this to the particular value that I will call d, dt of epsilon of t of lambda n of t phi n of t phi n of t. I truncate this basis in such a way that the error, I, I would like to choose this error epsilon which is essentially epsilon t here is defined as the sum of uh, n larger than m of uh, uh, the eigenvalues. The error that I commit approximate this, uh, 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 this operator here. And then I want to find this epsilon such that the error for approximate the state is a given number. Mm? Because I don't want to use all this information or irrelevant information in my system. I want to minimize it as more, uh, as, uh, uh, um, as possible, the dimension of the space. And so the question is how then this dimension d will depend on time and, uh, and on the dimension of the, of the space. Mm? So uh, it's surprising, it was surprising to me, uh, because okay, I, was, uh, I was preparing this for this lecture, I was just preparing some very simple calculation, then I realized that this problem can be solved exactly for a very generic system. So this is how I would like to present you the, uh, how to do it, and what's the result, which is uh, 
from my uh, perspective, is extremely uh, surprising. So, uh, what do I need to know in order to to compute these quantities now? Okay, um, as you, uh, if you want to access the uh, the the eigenvalues of the density matrix, a way is to compute the moment of the density matrix. The moment of the density matrix is defined as the phrase. So, <coughs> so if you now compute trace of rho t bar to the power alpha, mm, then if you imagine to expand the density matrix in the higher states, then this is simply given by the sum over all the eigenstates states of lambda n t to the alpha. Okay? Maybe you know already this because okay, they are related to the so-called Rene entropies. Some of you maybe uh, are familiar with this. So generally the Rene entropies as alpha are defined as the one over one minus alpha logarithm of trace of rho to the alpha. But okay, uh, for whom of you are not familiar with that, well, maybe they are more familiar with the von Neumann entropy. Mm? This you, without doubt, you, uh, you, re you uh, heard about that, I think. And then you have that the von Neumann entropy can be obtained in the limit alpha goes to zero, and it's given by the uh, minus phase of logarithm of the density matrix, rho log rho. Sorry? Ah, I forgot to one, you're right. Sorry, yeah. Let's put the, let's put a plus. I don't know. Okay, just to be sure. Although I think there are no problems general. <laughs> okay, um, and this is usually called, okay, a replica trick, in analogy with uh, uh, the replica trick in uh, statistical physics, when you, you compute the free energy as a limit, uh, uh, you consider replicas of your system as a leap in the replica go, go to zero. Yeah. Replica trick. This is replica. But anyway, uh, you see um, anyway that the, all the entropies here are, are simple functional of the moments. So if you compute the moments, we have the entropies and vice versa. Mm? And uh, uh, what I want to do is that uh, uh, we'll be, we'll, we'll make another step and be from the knowledge of these moments, we will extract the distribution of the eigenvalues. Okay? And I will uh, tell you how to do that. Actually, this was done a few years ago. It was, it was a proposal by Lefebvre and Calabrese. Uh, and uh, so I will uh, tell you the, how, how to do that. And then, so we'll, uh, we will be able to extract the distribution of the eigenvalues. And then from the distribution, we, we can uh, take the error under control. And we can estimate everything. Okay, um, what do we need to solve this problem, which seems uh, extremely complicated because I'm not assuming anything. Yeah. So, <coughs> so our first aim is to compute the moments of the density matrix. So, that's right. Yeah, one, one. Compute the moments of the time averaged state. Um, time average state, rho bar t equal one over t, v over t, and the tau of psi tau psi tau okay so let's start with this and then there will be two and so on uh, let's consider first the case uh, trace of rho squared just to understand what we we will see if you consider trace of rho squared see what do we find here we are to compute the trace of this time itself so we have 1 over t squared, the integral from 0 to t in the tau, integral from 0 to t, the tau prime of psi tau 
psi tau, psi tau prime, psi tau prime is the trace of this. So I'll show you like this. Hmm? This is what we have to compute. So you see that there is the overlap of the state different times. If you uh, consider a trace of rho cube, well, you are the same because you will have a, a, a product of overlaps of the state different time. So apparently to solve this problem, we have to know something about the overlaps uh, of the state. Mm? And uh, likely there are some uh, uh, very well known results for the overlap of the state in uh, rather generic systems. And uh, in particular, the, the claim, OK, if you want, it's not a claim, the class of system that I want to consider are system for which the energy cumulant, OK? So I will consider, I, I consider systems such that, uh, no, with, uh, with energy cumulants proportional to the number of sides. So this is a very mild uh, assumption. Why? Because if you now think, for example, equilibrium state of, uh, well, all the state in the middle of the spectrum, or even, OK, for whom of you, GGEs, generalized given ensemble, whatever, then you have uh, these properties fulfilled. So in this state, when you consider uh, very generally the, the cumulant of the energy, so the cumulant is rated, for example, with a, with a width of the, uh, of the microcanonical ensemble, if you want to describe a, a, a system at, uh, uh, at equilibrium. So you know that the width generally scales as the, uh, the square root of the, uh, of the number of degrees of freedom. Mm? And uh, the width is defined as the, the square root of the expectation value, essentially the, the standard deviation with respect to the, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the average value of the energy. And so what you know is that this behavior like in general, uh, in general system, like a square root of the number of degrees of freedom. So this is just the second cumulant. And what I'm saying is that uh, let's assume that this holds, so that all the cumulants are proportional to L. And uh, in particular, this happens when you consider Hamiltonian with local interactions, mm -hmm. and if the initial state is non critical. So if you consider initial state with uh, exponential decaying correlation, then you can prove, and if you want, well, I leave you as an exercise. You can prove that if the Hamiltonian's local interaction and the correlation decay exponentially, then all the cumulants are proportional to the number of sides. OK? So this will be our assumption. And uh, yes? So you're assuming that this is true at any time? It's well, yeah, you know, this is uh, independent of time. So it will be if it's true for initial state, it's always true. Uh, but I, I want to give you um, some evidence for this, OK? Because otherwise. Hmm. But uh, I want to give evidence for the overlap, which is closely, closely, mm, more closely related to, to what we are doing here. So if all the cumulants, energy cumulants, are proportional to L, there are some implications for the overlap. Why? Because you, <coughs> yeah, the overlap between the state at different times, tau and tau prime, if you now, uh, this is equal to the psi times 0, then you have the time evolution in reverse time up to tau, and then tau prime, and then you have this. OK? Now you can, uh, this is an expectation value of the exponential of our random variables. So this is equal to the, by definition, is the exponential, uh, yes, of the logarithm this is indeed of the expectation value of e by h tau minus tau prime. Mm? And this quantity is the one that defines the generative function, the cumulants of the, of the Hamiltonian. So this is equal to, this is a, by defi this is a definition of the cumulants. This is the exponential of a sum over n mm? of i to the n over n factorial. And here you have tau minus tau prime to the n. And here you have the 
how do I call them? Uh, e, okay, E maybe not, uh, K, KN. Hmm. And our assumption, okay, yeah, okay, what I'm doing is that I'm expanded it in the limit of uh, small tau, uh, for, sorry, in the limit tau prime close to tau. So this means that, okay, uh, we can't really, maybe there are cases where you can't, uh, these two objects are, are not exactly equal because this is a, a series of expansion, so they are equal in the neighbor, in the neighborhood of uh, tau close to tau prime. But then maybe this function could be non-analytic. So you can have, uh, well, the, I, I'm not uh, claiming that the, the convergence radius of this uh, series is uh, infinite because it's not in general. What I'm saying is that if you expand this in the limit of tau, let's say here, tau close to tau prime, then this is a definition of the cumulants and this is what we, what we have by definition. Now for our assumption, Kn are proportional to L. So well, let's redefine Kn in such a way that they are Kn divided by L. So let's just write this in this way. Okay, so Kn by definition, for example, K2 is equal to H squared minus H squared divided by L. Mm? Okay. So okay, this is a perturbative result. So maybe you, well, we are not sure that uh, it's true that this quantity here is always proportional to L. Maybe it's only perturbative proportional to L. Now I want to show you some evidence that instead uh, it is not the case. The general, when you have the cumulants proportional to L, also this function here is proportional to L for any tau and tau prime. And to the 10, okay. I show you some, uh, well, they are not, uh, some results for, for, uh, from a few years ago. Uh, about the so-called loch echo because the loch echo is uh, usually defined as the modulus squared of this of this object. So, well, you mean the two things are, are related. Uh, it's just we have to uh, consider only the real part of this, but uh, this is the substantial part. So, and okay, I, I'm using this uh, this paper uh, that uh, uh, the purpose of this paper is completely different. And this was written uh, after uh, a, a rather important paper on the, um, on the behavior of this Loch Mittek as a function of the time, because they discovered that in some cases, this function indeed can be singular. So you can have a analytic point. So after the discovery, then uh, Karash and Schurich uh, performed this numerical uh, simulation for several, several systems. This is why I want to show you the results, because then you see the the behavior of this, uh, of this overlap for uh, many, many systems. And in particular, okay, they started with uh, something which was already known, the easy model. This was studied even before by Heil, uh, Polkornikov, and Crane, for the, uh, uh, who, who wrote the, 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 the first paper on the dynamical phase transition, but anyway. So now we consider this easy model. G is the magnetic field. And they consider quantum quenches of the field, OK? And now this rate function L of t is essentially this divided by L. So uh, what they define is uh, L of t there is equal to 1 over L of the, uh, no, I'm not sure about the factor of 2, but uh, is, that, is it relevant? t psi 0 squared. There is a logarithm that I forgot, 1 over L. This is what they, they consider. So in order to, to be true that this is proportional to L, it means that this should be, uh, the, the limits of infinite L should exist, should be just a function. And there they plot the limit, actually, the limit L goes to infinity of this function. And what you see for the easy model, indeed, this is a, a, nice, a nice function for this particular choice of the parameter. And they wanted to point out the existence of these singular points. So in particular, this means that if you apply this expansion, that you can't expect that it goes beyond, beyond that singularity. Mm -hmm. Just uh, and um, but now from this, I want to emphasize some properties. You can see, in particular, this is always non-zero, apart from the uh, time equal to zero. And generally, what you see is that uh, in the, li the limit of infinite time exists for this quantity usually, and uh, it's some uh, some finite value. Okay, mm, there is a minus sign here. Is minus the limit, otherwise it wouldn't be negative. Instead, here is, is positive. Okay. So uh, I want also to stress what does it mean that this function is positive? It's non zero. 
it means that this overlap is exponentially small in L. Whatever tau and tau prime, prime you consider, this is exponentially small. Now, you can say this is an easy model. It's a very special model, a non-interactive model, integral by non-interacting. So, well, OK, uh, yeah, yeah, there are other results still for the easy model now for in a different phase. So because uh, despite being uh, simple, the model it displays several. The phase diagram is non-trivial. So you have a ferromagnetic phase, paramagnetic phase. But independent of the parameter, you see that that behavior essentially is the same. Okay. And uh, OK, they consider another model, the ANNN high model, where it's just uh, the, uh, uh, an easy model when you put also interaction between the next to nearest neighbor sites. So this is a non-integrable model now. This is a generic model. The phase diagram is more complicated. As you hear, there are ferromagnetic um, uh, regions, uh, paramagnetic regions. And uh, OK, now I don't remember the AP and the anti-phase floating. OK, the, it's kind of complex, the, the phase diagram of this model. So they study, uh, again, quenches of the parameter G and of the parameter de delta. They report the results. And again, this is what they found. Now, you see, this is a completely different model. It's, uh, it's non integrable. And uh, OK, uh, the behavior essentially is the same. Mm? The, OK, there is something that seems to be uh, against what I told you before, that this is non zero. So this seems to be zero. Mm, OK, this is not, uh, it's just very small. Uh, because if, if it were zero, it would have been periodic. So uh, it, it's not really zero. It's just a small for that particular value of the parameter. And then, OK, this is uh, other, uh, again, for other choice of the parameters. Again, usual pro same properties. This is, uh, again, OK, other quenches. OK, the, the shape you see can be terrible for this quantity, but still, you have that base non-zero. And it's a continuum function. And finally, OK, they can see also this uh, uh, generalized easy model, where you, what you do is that you, you rotate uh, the, the field. So this becomes a non-integrable uh, non model. And then they quench uh, phi, or they quench, I don't know, I don't know, g, or the magnetic field of phi. And you see, essentially, it's always the same, the same behavior. Uh, clearly, they focus on the cases where you have this kind of uh, singularities. In, uh, uh, you can always find uh, uh, quenches where you don't have singularities, just a smooth function of the time. So it's not, uh, that is an interesting case. OK, uh, I want to use these properties, only these properties. So we are assuming that the, the, this function that I will call, uh, OK, here it was L, now I call f of t, which is limit L goes to infinity of, of, the, uh, of the logarithm 1 over L, logarithm of psi 0 e to the i h say t, say 0. So uh, about this function, what I assume is that f of t has a single 0. At t equals 0, as you saw in all the cases. And then, uh, and then again, I assume that this is the fine. OK, this is. Uh, this limit exists. Okay. This limit exists. Okay. Uh, I don't think that I'm assuming. Uh, I don't assume anything. Uh, so this, this, sure. Okay. Under this assumption, then uh, let's try to compute the the moments of the density matrix, the of the of the time average state. Uh, question. So yes. I can see this limit in these plots. You can see yeah, in the plus uh, the limit was already taken. So this is already this function divided by the limit 1 L goes to infinity, 1 over L logarithm. This. So in this, all these cases, the limit exists, and this is the result. Because OK, as you see in all this model, the Hamilton is local. Mm? The, the interaction is only between the, the first, uh, the nearest neighbor, next to nearest neighbor side. And moreover, they, no, I'm not sure, but I, I think that they always consider initial states which are non-critical. So, and I, I'm, uh, I know examples when this doesn't hold. This was pointed out by Heil uh, to 
order of two years ago that uh, if you, for example, consider a, uh, a quench in the easing model, so you, consider you prepare the state in the critical easing model, which corresponds to magnetic field equal to one, okay, but they are critical, and then you, you consider quench where the time evolution uh, um, is, uh, is generated by the Hamiltonian, where you add the order parameter, just a, 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 an interaction which is proportional to the order parameter, which is in this model the spin in the in the uh, in a longitudinal direction if you consider this particular Hamiltonian with a particular state and you find that they even the second cumulant, cumulant scale in a different way with uh, with L yeah? this is due to the fact in critical system correlation decay uh, power laws so you can imagine that when you uh, when you compute this quantity you can have some uh, some contribution that don't go to zero okay so in uh, in this setup I will assume always that the system that the the uh, system are non-critical, okay? No. So uh, correlation decay exponential with L. Uh, sorry, uh, don't you assume that the real part uh, of F is negative? No, it's always, oh, F, sorry, there, there is minus sign here. Hmm? It's always positive, yes, it's non zero, uh, but it by definition it's positive, uh, the, the real part of this. Uh, because it's the, uh, if you want, it's the absolute value of the overlap. So this is always smaller or equal to one. So with a minus sign, uh, it's always by definition positive. But uh, yeah, mm. it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's analogous to, to, to assume this. It's strictly positive. This is what I'm saying for t larger than zero, for any finite t larger than zero. OK. Um, We have to compute this quantity, no? and now we use this result. Now we expand this in, a, in the cumulants. Why I'm doing this? Okay, well, you, you say, okay, this can be, what is it? Okay, first, let's write this in terms of uh, f. Okay, this is 1 over t squared, the integral, d tau, 0 t, 0 t, d tau prime of the exponential of the, uh, what is written there, the uh, one, okay, the logarithm of e to the i h tau minus tau prime, mm. okay. Now, for tau close to tau prime, I can expand this in the cumulants. Now, okay, there is a problem you saw also here, there are no so maybe you don't, you don't like if now I expand it in the cumulants. But in fact, I can do. Why? Because if I uh, choose tau, let's assume that tau minus tau prime is finite. It's a given number. Then this is exponentially small because the, this rate function L is finite. So this means that if I, uh, if I consider also the fact that this is not analytic, the, the tau can be much different from tau prime. That means that I'm just adding exponentially small term in the system side. So they are, in fact, uh, completely negligible if I find the result which scales in a different way here. So what I'm saying is that I can write this as the series expansion for tau close to tau prime up to exponentially small contribution in L. Okay, so let's say this is equal to 1 over t squared 0 t tau 0 t d tau prime and then you have the exponential of minus L f of t the function, okay, this is by, yeah, okay, yeah, it's like this, plus order exponential is small in L. That could come from the fact that I'm expanding close to uh, tau, close to tau prime. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, because, okay, t is tau minus tau prime. Now, uh, okay, let me, let me write this in the, uh, 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 as a series of cumulants, 1 of t squared, integral d tau, integral d tau prime, 0 t, 0 t, exponential of minus L sum over n from 0 to infinity of uh, i to the n over n factorial tau minus tau prime to the n, kn. Hmm? Plus, okay, uh, see. Mm. 
it out with the opposite uh, okay. <coughs> now what I mean is that in order this not to be exponentially small I need the, the time window here okay uh, actually I can work out this integral a bit more if you want let me do the last uh, step I can uh, uh, I can write the double integral as a single integral because the integral depends only on the difference. Mm -hmm. So where in particular I find a change in variable, this result, uh, you can prove it. Well, it's, it's very easy. The y, 1 plus y over square root of L. And here you have the exponential <coughs> minus L sum n from 0 to infinity of tau and it's tau prime to the n, kn. Okay. Oh, no, sorry. That's how my tau prime is. It's my new integration value. This is L. Uh, okay. Mm. By L. Okay. Let me write uh, as I did here. So it's minus k2 over L y squared t squared plus twice sum n from 2 to infinity of k to n over, because here I forgot that I had to take twice the real part, because there was the absolute value squared. Mm -hmm. okay. So here we have twice real part, k to n over L minus 1 to the n, yt to the 2n over 2n factorial l to the n minus 1. Okay, this is just this is a very simple uh, change of variables. You can, you, you, find, you can find it by uh, what I change probably is I redefine tau uh, y as uh, tau uh, divided by t and uh, divided by square root of l. So I did something like this. I just change the scale. <coughs> and I transform the double integral in a single in. in single integral okay so uh, this is what you find now what I'm saying is that consider this expression now this expression is uh, exponentially small is not exponentially small only in a very small uh, time window hmm? for this y close to zero not close to zero y finite in fact so what you can show is that <coughs> as you can see here in this time, this time window should approach zero in the thermodynamic limit. Because for any finite time, the difference was exponentially small. So in order to have something which is not exponentially small, it must be very, very close to zero. So our time window should, should shrink in the thermodynamic limit. But if you shrink the, 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 the time window, this seri uh, series here yeah, becomes an asymptotic series in terms of the volume for, for the number of sides. So you have that the second cumulant is, becomes larger than the other cumulants because they drop, they have a different power law with, uh, with which they go to zero in, the, in L. So what happens here is that uh, uh, the leading contribution to this integral is given just by the second cumulant. So all this contribution uh, give uh, correction, hmm? but uh, power law correction, in fact. But what you have is that you just have to compute a Gaussian integral in order to, to access uh, the, the leading behavior of the integral. Okay? So well let me write here the result. So in the limit, if uh, uh, L is very large, L is very large, so this integral becomes so we have a trace of rho squared t for fixed t. So the time is fixed, it's just a parameter of our problem, the time window for L is large, and then this becomes just a Gaussian integral here. Uh, zero square root of L dy square root of L of, the, of a Gaussian. Hmm. K2 over L y square t square. And we are able to, to perform this integral. In particular, we, we immediately uh, notice that this term well, well, uh, drops to zero. It's uh, just a correction. And as a matter of fact, it's the leading correction hmm, uh, to the asymptotic result. But the asymptotic result is given by this part, hmm, which is the, just the Gaussian integral, which is, is, uh, which is equal to uh, right, yeah. square root of pi over k2 
Nah, here I follow I didn't. Okay. K2 L times T. How do I define here? Yeah, maybe I change the notation here in just a moment. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. T minus one. Okay, this is correct. Okay. So you have this. Plus, okay. Here there are correction here. One plus the correction is order of L to minus one half. This is the asymptotic behavior of this integral, yes? Yes. And this the screen the cumulants they are all fixed by initial condition, right? Yes. So we can always choose to Yes. You can choose your uh, state uh, which satisfies this condition. Okay, okay. So yeah. but uh, what I'm saying is that it's very general. So even you, you don't have just to uh, to do some fine tuning. It's the opposite. You have to do fine tuning to find a system where this doesn't hold. So okay. <laughs> so this is the generic uh, yeah. result. Well, it simply tells you that the when you consider um, I think that the easiest uh, qualitative uh, I, I can tell you with what this is connected with the fact that the general you consider states with cluster decomposition properties. So you consider a state where the expectation value of observables which are far away from each other approach zero. And in particular, in this case, we assume that they approach zero exponential. So this is a if and only if, in a sense. So it's really related to, the, to this property of the state. You can, for example, I, you can immediately um, find exceptions. If you consider a cut state, all spin up plus all spin down, mm -hmm. this state doesn't have plus the decomposition properties, yeah. for example. So you, you, it's easy to find exceptions. This doesn't mean that, OK, for this particular state, probably this is fine anyway, but anyway. <laughs> not, uh, OK. So uh, well, you, you can check if you want. But uh, this is the asymptotic expansion of this integral. Also check it uh, numerically, so it's in, just to be sure it's, uh, 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 it's not difficult to prove. And uh, OK, so from this, we can, uh, for example, extract the, the Rényi entropy. So as I defined before, or well, if you want, the second Rényi entropy, then this means that it behaves in the limit of large L like, uh, well, what is it? Square root, uh, right here, like uh, the okay, one half uh, log. Okay, how the log or L? Okay, log of uh, L uh, plus one half log of uh, k two t squared over pi plus order L to the minus one half. OK, so we, we computed the second Rényi entropy. Now, uh, in order to, well, we need uh, much more than this. No, because we, we need uh, the expectation, all the moments of density metrics if we want to, uh, to find the distribution. Okay? Uh, it's just that we compute the, the, the average of uh, the mean value of x squared that we want to infer the, the form of the distribution. So we need uh, all the moments. And uh, likely, this can be done. Essentially, doing the same exact calculation, you can generalize it, and there is nothing much complicated. You have to work with a multi-dimensional integral, so you have, uh, and in the end, what you find is that uh, in all the cases for any exponent here, you have uh, all the cumulants uh, higher than the second one are irrelevant, just contribute to the to some leading correction, okay, to the, the correction, leading correction, and uh, so finally you end up always with a Gaussian integral. Of some uh, of some integration, okay, is a Gaussian integral. So you can uh, you can in fact uh, compute it. You can uh, find the the asymptotic behavior, and I just tell you the result because it's uh, it's late to to make the calculation. Not really particular interesting. So what you what you find is that. So the trace of rho bar t to the alpha behave in the limit of large L as, uh, as alpha minus 1 half, well, yes, no, no, k2 over 2 pi 
to the 1 minus alpha over 2 t 1 minus alpha alpha l to the uh, 1 minus alpha over 2 plus there are always correction okay. 1 plus order of l to the minus 1 alpha this is what you find this is the asymptotic behavior in the limit so this is in the limit of large L. Mm. OK, so the, uh, the problem now becomes, uh, well, we know the moments. Can we infer the distribution? Generally, this cannot be done. OK, this is uh, a mathematical, uh, complicated mathematical problem. And in particular, if you know, for example, the distribution of, uh, if your distribution is one dimensional and uh, as a support from uh, minus infinity to infinity or zero to infinity, you, uh, you can find distribution with the same moments. So this is uh, a, a, it's not a determinate problem. Okay? It, it doesn't have a unique solution in general. The fact here is that uh, the density matrix has eigenvalues between zero and one. So the support is bounded. And for this kind of problems, the moments uh, characterize completely the distribution. So this means from, for, from the moments, we can infer the distribution. This is the uh, this is a kind of exciting part, because generally what you have access in, uh, uh, in this uh, many-body uh, system is the moments of the density matrix. You, there are many uh, <coughs> theoretical, uh, uh, theoretical methods to obtain that, for example, in critical system or whatever. So you have access to this. But then it's extremely surprising that you can also infer the distribution for the moment. So the extremely uh, strong result. And uh, OK, uh, how do you do that? This was proposed by uh, Calabrese and Lefebvre in uh, 2000, I don't remember. 2000, uh, where is it written here? Uh, 2008. OK, so I, I give you the reference. So the reference are from from moments of the of a density matrix matrix to the distribution distribution of eigenvalues. The reference is this one, so Calabrese. And uh, the paper is uh, uh, okay. Physica review A uh, seventy-eight. The number is zero three uh, twenty-three twenty-nine. Okay, two thousand eight. So they 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 did this for a completely different reason. We, they had some results in a particular states, uh, called critical states, uh, formal critical states, and then they were able to, um, to find an approximation for the distribution of the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix in the states. Here I just want to use the same uh, procedure. So I'm not using the result, but I just tell you how to do that. So the idea is to define <coughs> a function uh, <coughs> the main idea, so you define a function phi, hmm? phi of lambda. OK, first, just one. let's define p. We define p of lambda, first of all, which is given by the sum over all the eigenvalues of the density matrix of the delta lambda minus lambda n. So this is the non-normalized distribution of uh, eigenvalues. Why I am saying that it's not normalized? Because if you integrate this, you find the dimension, the number of uh, eigenstates, which is the dimension of the universe space. So the uh, particular, the, you have the, the, the integral of p lambda and lambda, in our case of spin chains, will be equal to 2 to the L. OK? And, uh, and all the other moments of this distribution, so if you compute now the integral of lambda, to the alpha uh, p of lambda in the lambda, mm? 
this becomes equal to the integral in the lambda sum over n of delta lambda minus lambda n lambda to the alpha, hmm, which is equal to the sum over n of lambda n to the alpha, which by definition is the trace of rho to the alpha. So you see that the, uh, the moment of this distribution, phi of lambda, are the moments of the well, density layers that we computed before. Hmm? So, uh, so our aim would be to, to compute this p of lambda. But in particular, it's, uh, we, what we can uh, compute is the compute is the function phi of lambda which is defined just as lambda p of lambda so it's nothing but just proportional to lambda and uh, uh, because what you find is that if uh, uh, what yes what do you find is that so clearly this function is by definition sum over n of lambda n delta lambda minus lambda n okay well, and uh, uh, what you see is that the <coughs> the uh, this phi can be written as the limit epsilon goes to zero plus of the imaginary part of another function which I now call the uh, I don't know how to call it okay. phi 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 of uh, lambda minus f i epsilon where this function phi phi of z is equal to 1 over pi sum n goes to 1 to infinity of z to the n trace rho to the n. So uh, how can you see this? This is not, uh, it's more complicated than it is, <laughs> it appears. Because now if you imagine to, to resum, assuming that this is convergent, already. if you resum the sum, you just find 1 over, this will be the integral in the lambda, uh, probably there is a 1 over pi here. Uh, integral, where is the integral? There is the integral. There is a sum. Mm. What is it? Okay, sum of n. Ah, yes, it's integral. Okay. This is the integral of the lambda p of lambda divided by lambda minus z in the lambda. You do this because if you sum zn rho n, you find 1 over z rho, and then this becomes a pole, this is just this part. Then you have divided by lambda. So this is minus n, sorry. Yes, minus n. So you find this, and then, uh, uh, so from this, if you now subtract i epsilon, then from here, and you extract the imaginary part, this becomes a, d a d mm -hmm. delta function, and this gives you a distribution, essentially, okay? So this is the, the trick used to, to obtain distribution. OK, now the, the, uh, this is essentially what I proposed. Then it worked in that case. And then I'm, uh, we can do the same. And what I'm doing is that I, I use my asym the asymptotic result uh, that I show you. Mm? And we plug the asymptotic result here. And we see what, uh, if we can uh, compute this imaginary part in this limit. So if we do, <coughs> if you now compute this quantity, what we find is the default. So we have phi of z in our case, so now is the for the time average state, hmm, is equal BA, as this is our asymptotic result, sum n from 1 to infinity of z to the minus n divided by square root of n. And then here we have K2L uh, t squared over 2 pi to the 1 minus n over 2, the result that I wrote before there, OK? You have to compute this. And you recognize, uh, if you are a bit familiar with polylog function, you recognize that this is a polylog function. And it is just uh, the argument to the n divided by a power of n. This is a polylogarithm, it's a definition. So this is equal to uh, square root of k2 over 2 pi cube of L 
we do one half time and then here the, the polylog which I repeat is just a definition is just the function uh, defined as a series so it's L one half of square root of 2 pi over k2 1 over L one half uh, tz where indeed uh, li one half of x is defined as sum over n of uh, let's write for a generic new uh, x to the n over new oh sorry uh, over n to the new the definition of the polylog yeah so just a, a different way to write it but what is nice because uh, well, every time that you find a way to write a series it means the mathematicians work on that and so in particular we know the properties of this punch and we know how to extract the imaginary part of this punch when you displace the argument by one by i epsilon hmm? so uh, we can use this the following result which is you can find is so generally you can be so known that you can find in wikipedia so you find you have that the limit epsilon goes to zero plus of li nu of x plus i epsilon is equal to pi logarithm of x the nu minus one divided by gamma of nu and there is a theta h the step function so this means that this is non-zero only if x is larger than one hmm? And then you have the behaves like a logarithm to some power of the logarithm, and this divided by gamma of nu is the generalization of the factorial. So gamma of nu plus one is nu factorial. Okay, so this is the gamma function. Okay, anyway, so we can just use this uh, this result, this, has in the, this result for the polylog, and compute our phi lambda p in our case. Clearly, okay, this will be only an asymptotic result because we only compute the leading order. Hmm? So. Uh, sorry? What is new? New can be whatever uh, it's. Uh, this holds for a new larger than zero, I think. This formula holds for new larger than zero, any real number. Uh, it's the same argument of the polylog. Yeah, it's the. Yeah. the polylog ah. of ah, no, in, our, in our case, we have uh, new equal one half. Okay, uh, no. I just uh, gave you the general uh, formula. Okay, so we can. Uh, can simply use this result and what we find mm -hmm. you do right uh, let's write uh, phi mm -hmm. the lambda phi of lambda in our case, is equal to the, okay, no, let's write in a human way. <laughs> so, uh, okay, phi of lambda is equal to L to the one half T divided by, uh, divided by pi, and then there is uh, uh, nothing here, square root of K2 over the logarithm of two pi over uh, k2 l the so one half t squared lambda squared theta h the the heavy side uh, the step function to pi over k2 1 over l one half t minus lambda so what is this this pi now i show you because i show this function so this function is this one sum of j lambda j, this is the shape. Yeah. And uh, you see there is a, a logarithmic singularity. Yeah. At the both, uh, no, here essentially. Here is singular. Mm -hmm. And but it's integrable. Okay, it's a, an integrable singularity. And here uh, it behaves, okay, this is a, a, it's integral also here. Mm -hmm. the, this function, but clearly, as you can see that. And, uh, uh, and mm, mm, nothing great. This is just the distribution of the eigenvalues for a completely generic system. I didn't assume any, almost anything, just the, the behavior of the cumulants. And then I found this result, which is very surprising. And this omega here is just this number here, which scales as the square root of L is this part. It's uh, omega is, uh, OK, now I want to, should be this probably. Um, it's here. Uh, omega should be uh, square root 
k2 l over 2 pi I think is this omega uh, I didn't write yet okay. this omega mm. yes exactly this is the omega so uh, and what you see is that the maximal eigenvalue actually uh, scales with l to the minus 1 alpha so it becomes smaller and smaller the eigenvalues mm? as we could have been far immediately considered the secondary entry but anyway so this is just a distribution and here I <coughs> I also plotted the integral now of the of this sum of delta what is the meaning of this this is the number of states with eigenvalues larger than lambda okay the number of states uh, so this is just the integral of the function p that I defined before so what is written there is the integral from lambda the lambda of p of lambda if I have this this is essentially what I was uh, what I was calling I called before m of d what I was looking for before because what I can now uh, what, what I want to do is to cut the eigenvalues I want to consider all the eigenvalues larger than the given value which will be called so this is uh, uh, this particular lambda such that the error, the error that I commit which is given by the integral of phi mm, up to the particular value of lambda lambda epsilon t the error is a given uh, value fixed a priori and I can compute it okay. and uh, uh, what do I find you can uh, well uh, it's really simple you can this the integral of this function is very simple both of uh, phi and lambda so you can compute it immediately it's uh, uh, if you want you can do it by uh, as an exercise and uh, what do you find is the following is that the this dt this d uh, t of epsilon t where epsilon t and now I define everybody is behave li like the square root of twice k2 over pi the inverse error function 1 minus epsilon t l 1 half t now the error function is just the error function is defined I, uh, I hope that the uh, okay, it, it should be something like this. integral uh, between 0 and x in the y of e to the minus y squared uh, I, uh, probably that is over 2 is the integral of the gauche the error function so error function to the minus 1 is the inverse of this okay and uh, well and this is what you find so this is the asymptotic result of the of for this d for given error epsilon what was epsilon so D, this is the number of state I, I repeat this is the number of states I have to keep to keep to keep keep such that the error that I commit is epsilon t so it means that the trace of the, um, uh, the density matrix rho t when I when I consider only the eigenvalues larger than the given lambda epsilon t is equal to epsilon t so I define this value lambda epsilon t that then finally will go here this is d this is d t epsilon t lambda epsilon t so this is the this counts the number of states with eigenvalues larger than lambda epsilon t the error that you commit is the lambda is large sorry is the opposite lambda the error that you commit is the uh, is the sum of, of the eigenvalues for lambda smaller the lambda epsilon t and we want to fix this error some parameter epsilon t and this is what you what you find okay now it's uh, it's late and uh, yeah i think we will uh, uh, I want to conclude, okay, uh, I just, uh, with just an observation, that here this error is on the time average state, okay, and uh, you, can wor uh, you can wonder indeed why I introduce this time dependence on this error. The reason is that I would like to fix the error on the state, not on the time average, because I want to follow the time evolution every time in such a way that it should be good, the approximation at every time. I don't care if it's only good in average. 
I want to describe all the dynamics. So I should expect that in order to fix the error on the state, I have to put some time dependence on the, on the error on the average in a time window. And so we'll come back next time about uh, how to choose this epsilon t. And it will be just a very, the, the simplest way that you can imagine, because you have, a, in the, I stress, we have a, an error on the average. And we want to infer from the error from the, uh, on the average the error on the sample of the population. So you can imagine, if you assume some independence of the state at different times, it's just uh, you, you make some Gaussian approximation, and then you say that this error should scale uh, like one of the square root of the time, because you are integrating from zero to time. This is the number of states you are considering. So what we will see indeed, what I will do next time, is to use the sunsets, epsilon t scaled like, OK, some. We'll scale in this way. Well, delta t uh, parameterize the error that we want to commit. So we will do this. And then uh, we will see then how this dt scale, we will discuss that. And I will show you some numerical data that prove that what we did here uh, is not just a mistake of a non careful uh, asymptotic expansion, but it's really what you what you see in, uh, in rather generic systems. OK? And uh, it is OK. I, uh, see, you, see you next week. Exactly. This is the uh, indeed we can immediately infer there is something weird. Yeah. Because I would have when I started the calculation I would have expected a, a different behavior. I would expect a, a behavior of the Renier entry proportion to the time. I would expect to spread more the state. And indeed when I uh, obtained this result, I was extremely uh, critic of the result. I would say no, this is maybe there is a, something wrong in the asymptotic expansion. And I had to sh to, to see it really numerically to, com to convince myself that he is correct. And it's, uh, apparently the, il the, the, the relevant space where the state lies is extremely small. It scales as square root of L. And like uh, you will see t, uh, then even if you consider this term here, then here this gives just a logarithmic correction. So essentially, it goes like t times log t, square root of log t. Or and so it's a very, very uh, mild dependence on the time and, uh, and very uh, extremely uh, small space, considering that the Hilbert space is e to the L, is 2 to the L. So this is the square root of the logarithm of the Hilbert space. Is, mm, I wasn't expecting this, uh, this behavior. This just shows us that the, uh, when we describe this time evolution, even if the time is large, then we are just seeing a very small part of the of the Hilbert space. If you uh, now, I just tell you, if you do now the same, but in the diagonal sum, with the opposite limit, L is fixed and T is large, then what you find is that what you uh, you can expect that this becomes exponentially large in the volume, and. Uh, Okay, no, it becomes independent of t, but uh, uh, very exponentially large in the volume. So it scales as the Hilbert space, then, the number of states. So uh, with this, I would like to persuade you that indeed there, are, there is a theoretical reason why it's better to consider first the thermodynamic limit, because we, are, we need much less information than in the other limit. When you need to fix indeed, the, uh, you, you need to know all these exponentially large number of states. Here, just a tiny part of the, of the Hilbert space. Okay. Contribute. This is uh, okay. I don't know if uh, uh, I can give you references on this. I don't know if it's new or not. So I. <laughs> that, so. so if you have a question, ask me. I, I will give you some uh, notes, and I already wrote them. And, uh,